Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Check mic, check, check. Testing one, two, three. Masterworks 2023. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Stay tuned. We will be live in approximately half an hour. Check, check. Testing, testing, welcome to Masterworks 2023. Check, check, mic check. Modern Canada is quite a massive country, as we all know, and it's also quite a new country, only existing as an independent nation since 1867. And I say independent because while Canada was not actually...
Good morning. Good morning, IPS. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Island Pacific School Masterworks 2023. So we would first like to acknowledge that we live and play and have our school on traditional lands of the Squamish Nation. Uh, we had some professional development a while ago uh, with a woman from the Squamish Nation, and she told us that it's really great to acknowledge where you personally come from and what your land is from. So my family is from Denmark originally, and I grew up in Ontario in what is traditionally the Anishinaabe lands, which is really interesting um, to remember. So for us here, we're really thankful that we get to live on this land. Uh, this is the 28th year of Masterworks at Island Pacific School. It's wonderful that we have family of our students, but also some of our neighbors and supporters of the school. So welcome to that. We also are live streaming on our uh, YouTube channel. So anyone who's out there in uh, the online world, welcome also. There, this is really the, a year long process. So today is a distillation of what's been going on with the grade nines for an entire year. So I'll tell you a little bit about the process because it's pretty incredible. The grade nines who have been watching Masterworks since they were in grade six, over the summer uh, of last summer, choose what they want to do for Masterworks. And really, it is their choice. This is a self-selected and self-directed project that they take on for an entire year. So picking well is super important. All of you students in the audience, remember this, okay? Picking well is important. You want something that you're gonna be interested in for an entire year that's gonna set you up potentially for things that you may wanna do in the future. Uh, they have written under the guidance of a faculty advisor, one of the teachers at IPS, but also an external advisor who is either an expert in their field or professional in the field that the student's studying. Uh, under their guidance, they've written a 20 to 30 or sometimes more page paper. And then what you're getting today, their presentation, is the best of what's in that paper. So they really are the experts in the room on their particular topic. And so it's wonderful to have them be teaching us for this whole week. Uh, so thank you, grade nines, for taking over our job. Uh, the, there are some customs that we go by during this week. The grade nines are called by their last names. And also, we have this beautiful statue here that was donated by Ian Henley, who's a big supporter of the arts on Bowen and also of our school. And it's called the team, which really represents uh, the fact that there are a lot of people supporting our students to get where they are today. So students usually touch this for luck before they come up and do their presentation. Uh, what will happen today is that each student will come up and do their presentation uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes. Then there'll be a question and answer period. So everyone in the audience, make sure that you've got some questions brewing as uh, the students teaching you some interesting things. Uh, there, the question and answer period, I'm going to, if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to put up your hand and then I'm going to select you to come forward to here where you can ask that question. So that will help us out with the sound system. Uh, after that, the advisors will meet with the student to see if they've met the requirements of the Masterworks program. And then we take a short reset. Well, we're taking a recess while that's happening. When they come back, that's when I will make a formal announcement about their standing in the Masterworks program. And then we'll start on the next student. So this is happening for the next three days. So anyone in the audience, if you wanna invite your friends, your family, uh, it would be great to have lots of people listening to what these grade nines have to offer. And on that note, I would like to welcome Mr. Max Lee to come up and talk to us. <laughs> 100 is a big number. 100 burgers, 100 pianos, 100 children. All are quite abundant. In fact, 
100 is so large, it is even hard to visualize it. Try to picture in your mind those 100 burgers exactly. No more, no less. Well, some people will come to realize that it's quite hard to do because 100 is just too big to keep track of. Now, it may seem like that 100 is all of a sudden unimaginably large, but it is merely the start. In the world of numbers, numbers like 100 are actually small numbers. Some of these small numbers we encounter on a regular basis on our daily lives, such as the quantities of everyday objects, like the number of pedestrians in a city, or more abstract concepts, such as time, temperature, and distance. Beyond small numbers, we encounter larger and otherworldly numbers. These numbers exist beyond our reality and have little to no implication to us. They are so vast that they are impossible to truly comprehend, and even the description of their size is also incomprehensible. As we continue to look further beyond reality, we will see numbers reaching towards the upper limit of what we can conceive as of finite. We begin to approach the concept of infinity. Infinity is not just a mathematical concept, but a philosophical one as well, inspiring questions about the nature of reality, existence, and the universe. Here's when things get tricky, as we are dealing with a something that is completely beyond our ability to measure or understand. Today, I'll take you on a walk, a big walk, that travels from here to infinity and beyond, <laughs> as you hopefully learn new concepts along the way. You'll go on a venture that explores the big, the small, and the infinite. This expedition will reveal the true size of large numbers and the meaning of infinity. Good morning, my name is Max Lee, and welcome to A Journey to Infinity, a masterworks by me. It begins like this. Here you are, standing in a pitch black room. You ponder for a bit and realize that you don't even know if you're standing in a room at all, or if you're even in a standing body at all. You are probably in empty space, and you also are probably empty space. This is zero. Zero existed way before the invention of counting, way before the birth of humans, and way before the creation of the universe. It is the blank sheet of canvas everything is on, a canvas that existed before the paint, the paintbrush, and the artist. Suddenly, the darkness disappears around you, and you wake up, consciously standing in a perfectly salt flat pan with no other geological feature, uh, features spanning the range of your visibility. There are no clouds or visible light source in the brightly lit blue sky, and the only object you see is the start of a highway shooting straight into the horizon. You take your first step on this road. Your step is one. Uh, one uh, your step is one meter long, and this is one, the first number on the number line. So we begin part one, the beginning of the number line. Possibly 40,000 years ago, during the period of global cooling, one uncredited hero completely revolutionized the world they lived in. A caveman unearthed a concept that will forge the very basis in the realms of science, engineering, maths, and logic itself. An enlightened caveman realized that two mammoths were no longer a mammoth and a mammoth, but rather two mammoths. <laughs> the caveman has unknowingly created counting and passed this wisdom to his fellow tribe, which likely used counting for monitoring social and economic data, like the number of tribe uh, members or prey animals. Most caimen in this period likely used body parts, such as fingers or tally marks engraved on bones to count, such as this Labombo bone, which was the earliest potential evidence of counting, dated to 42,000 years ago. The earliest unambiguous evidence for numbers emerged around 4000 BCE in Sumeria, Mesopotamia. As one of the early civilizations with increasing population and assets, the city needed a way to keep track of everything. To solve this issue, the ancient Sumerians developed a method of accounting and currency using clay cones. Each cone held by a person can represent something tangible, such as chickens. If a person has four cones, it shows that they have four chickens. If another person has four different cones, it could represent four bags of grain. This idea was amazing. But wait a minute, someone soon realized that the idea of cones weren't needed at all. Previously, the cones were stored in pouches with the number of clay cones written on the outside of the pouch. So this ra then raises the question, why are the cones needed at all when the pouch already symbolizes the cones worth? Why don't we just write nine marks on a clay tablet and discard the clay cones? This is precisely what happened. The Sumerians basically transitioned from paper money to digital currency. Let's get back on our journey. It turns out the highway counts every meter you walk, 
So one would be one meter and 100 would be 100 meters. It first counted your steps using tally marks but transitioned to ancient Sumerian numerals. However, they are quite easy to decipher. As it turns out, there are two different characters representing the values one and 10. On the 60th step or meter, you find the next numerical system, Roman numerals. Roman numerals originated around 900 BCE and they are fascinating because they added the concept of subtraction into its numeral system. It, if a numeral appears before a higher value, it would be subtracted rather than added. So IV would equal four while VI would equal six. This innovation made Roman numerals more difficult to understand and now, because now the position of individual characters can directly change the value of the number. Still, Roman numerals fall inefficient when notating larger numbers. CX is 110, CCX LV is 245, but this, that would definitely take a long time to decipher if you know what I mean. Now how about this or that? <laughs> Although the Roman numerals is a creative numerical system, it is still not free from large imperfections. As you keep walking, you reach 100,000, and you pause for a moment to look back at the distance you have traveled. At this point, you've walked the distance from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of Challenger Deep, there and back two and a half times already. Despite the arduous 24-hour walk, you feel no compulsion to rest, so you keep on walking. And on the next step, a new numer uh, numeral system appears. Introduced in the 6th or 7th century is the base 10 Hindu Arabic numeral system, the father of our modern decimal system. And just like the modern decimal system, the Hindu Arabic system could construct any whole number by only using these 10 unique symbols. As an example, the name number 804,532 is just that. One key feature of these systems is the concept of positional notation. With the old primitive method of counting, humans had to draw many rep uh, symbols repetitively and invent new symbols for higher magnitude numbers. However, with a positional system, the problem can be tossed aside because this allows the reuse of say the same symbols representing different values depending on the position in the sequence. And not only does the Hindu uh, Arabic system use, our, use positional notation, it also utilizes our base 10 positional notation, which is proven to be quite useful. And in fact, the Hindu Arabic system was so successful that by the 15th century, it had completely replaced the Roman numerals and other systems throughout Eurasia in everyday life, becoming the most popular number system in the world. Congratulations, you have walked a trillion meters. And this journey took more than 22,000 years to complete. And at this point, you've walked from Earth past Jupiter. You stare at the daunting road which you have crossed and you shake your head in disbelief. And to emphasize how large a trillion is, I'll propose a thought experiment. So the average marble is around 13 millimeters in diameter. That means a box of marbles, uh, uh, that means a million marbles would be a box around this, this big maybe a bit bigger. And that would probably be enough to fill a bathtub. Now, a billion marbles would fill the entirety of this chapel, possibly even two chapels. Just imagine how much bathtubs would fill this chapel. <laughs> Finally, we get to a trillion, and that is enough marbles to cover every single area of Bowen Island in almost two layers of marbles. The, nast the last numerical system is scientific notation which is introduced by French philosopher René Descartes. Some of you here may be familiar with scientific notation, which is another way of writing numbers that excel in representing very large or small numbers. This is a quick explanation. The scientific notation consists of two variables, the variable m, where m is greater than or equal to one, but less than 10, and the variable n, where n is any integer. When dealing with larger modern numbers, almost all are described using scientific notation because of its efficiency. Instead of expending more effort and making unnecessary large numbers like this, the scientific notation can write it like this. You have traveled 100 quintillion meters. That is one followed by 50 zeros. <laughs> it took more than two quintillion years of nonstop walking, which is a time so long you have outlived everything in the universe except black holes. Now this number is so unfathomably large that a garden snail can circle the entire observable universe 
273 quintillion times in this time. Or watch this video around 40 trillion times. <laughs> You've walked past one, ten, a thousand, a million, a billion, trillion, past one quintillion, as well as the entirety of human history. Yet, however great these numbers seem to you, the next numbers will resemble one infinitely greater. This is because you only scratched the surface of the number line. You've only seen the numbers that, the hu that humanity thinks big. It's now time to, see, it's, it's time to see the numbers that the universe sees big. Welcome to part two, numbers beyond the universe. So you've walked 10 to the power of 91 meters already, and you think the next major stop on this road is Google, or 10 to the power of 100, which feels an inch away, but no. Even though you are currently at 10 to the power 91, it is important to not be deceived by the visual proximity between 10 to the power 91 and 10 to the power 100. Uh, because of the huge increase between each power, you've only walked 0.0000001% of Google. <laughs> this is how the big numbers count. Not by 1, 2, 3, or 10, 20, 30, but rather 10, 100, 1000. Soon, that method of counting wouldn't even be enough. However, with nothing else to do, you continue along the road to Google. Google was introduced by a mathematician called Kasnier. His only goal was to come up with a big number. And in the end, he created 10 to the power of 100, which his nine-year-old nephew called Google. But how big is one followed by 100 zeros? Suppose um, person A were to drive a Google meters at a constant speed of um, 100 kilometers per hour, and person B were to transport Earth to the Andromeda galaxy on foot, one atom at a time. So the race starts, and person B takes one atom from Earth and begins to walk towards the Andromeda galaxy. And assuming the two galaxies aren't moving, after hundreds and trillions of years, person B transports the first atom of Earth to the Andromeda galaxy, oh, to the Andromeda galaxy, and begins his journey back. And after a long, long time, person B finally finishes the race first by transporting every single atom on Earth to the Andromeda galaxy, one at a time. Now how about person A? In fact, a Google Meters is so long that by the time person B finishes the race, person A would still look like he hasn't even started because person A has only completed 0.000023 zeros and 12% of his journey. Yes, Google is big, surpassing even the number of particles in the observable universe or the number of grains of sand that could fill the observable universe but we can go bigger. For example, the number of possible chess games is a number far greater than Google. You are staring at the endless sky when you suddenly wonder if you'll be stuck on this road for your eternal life. This thought should drive you insane, but it doesn't. In fact, you are quite calm. Maybe you spent so long in this realm that you don't even care anymore. Your thought quickly cheers off when you see a Googleplex. In addition to Google, Kasnier also thought about a number much larger than it. He raised 10 to the power of Google, calling it a Googleplex, which is one with a Google zeros. Now suppose you were trying to write down every digit of a Googleplex on your phone. So you open up your notes or docs or whatever and start write down and write a one followed by a bunch of zeros. And after a while, your phone runs out of storage, filled to the brim with zeros. So you think for a bit and phone your friend. You tell your friend that you need them to start writing zeros on their phone. So they agree and do so. However, soon both of your phones run out of space. So you call Google, the corporation, and tell them to start writing down zeros. However, soon later they use up all their storage. You begin to get desperate, so you tell everybody in the world to start writing down zeros on every memory card available. But in fact, every single memory card in the world runs out of storage. In fact, a Googleplex is so large that even if you start filling the entire Milky Way galaxy with those one terabyte micro SD cards, it still wouldn't fit all the digits of a Googleplex. And even if you filled the entire observable universe with those one terabyte micro SD cards, you still would run out of space. Here's another remarkable feature of a Googleplex. Imagine you had a universe that was a Googleplex meters across. And this, uni this universe would actually be so big that if you traveled far enough in that universe, you would, you would expect to see repetitions of exact copies of yourself. Why? Well, um, take the number of quantum states that a person occupies, which is basically the number of different ways the particles that occupy this volume can be arranged. 
and in, it is around 10 to the power 10 to the 70, uh, 10 to the power 10 to the 70. Number of different ways you can build this volume of space. So the particles that build up U can be arranged into a dog, a chair, or something else. However, this number is way smaller than a Googleplex, which is 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 100. This means, by pure chance, somewhere in the universe, you will run into an arrangement of particles that match you exactly. You are trapped in this unchanging plane. There's nothing other than the road, sky, and numbers that you're allowed to see. Yet for some reason, you think there's some other meaning to this place. You think you need to find infinity. After literally forever, you finally encounter one of the greatest numbers in the world, Graham's number. No matter how reality warping this number is, you still keep in mind that it is always closer to zero than it is to infinity. So you begin to think you'll never reach infinity. This massive number uh, dwarfs other numbers, yet gets dwarfed by infinity. Graham's number is so large that the observable universe literally cannot contain Graham's number. Take the smallest measurement, a Planck volume, which is the universe's pixel. If it is possible to write down a single digit of Graham's number per single Planck volume in the observable universe, you will run out of room way before you get to the end of the number. Graham's number is so large that I can confidently say anything that can describe the size of the Graham's number, and it's probably true. If, say, for example, if the observable universe were to be stuffed with information containing every single digit of Graham's number, it would probably cause a big bang and turn the observable universe into a black hole. <laughs> Even the number of different possible ways that every single particle could have interacted with each other from the start of the universe to the heat death of the universe is way less than Graham's number. In fact, Graham's number is so large that it will probably take me t around 10 minutes to explain what it even is, which is actually a reasonable amount of time. But for now, it is a really big number that I would be surprised if you overestimate. <laughs> you depart from Graham's number, a number so large it feels like it could be comparable to infinity. And to humans and other things, this number might as well be infinity because it's too big to reach. But you walk Graham's number. So that means it's not infinity. You look behind you, and although you can't see the start of the road, you know it's there. You look forward and fail to find the end of the road. But this time, there is no end of the road. No matter where you are at on this road, you will, be always, you will always be closer to the start of the road. And no matter where you are at on this road, you will always have to travel the same distance to the end of this road. Whether, it's whether you are at one, Graham's number, or Graham's number to the power of Graham's number. And all of a sudden, Graham's number feels insignificant. You walk past Graham's number feeling inconsiderably small. But an idea crosses your mind. You've been looking at infinity the wrong way. You've been viewing infinity as this massive, grand concept looming above the sky. That is true, but you will never reach infinity if you're chasing it this way. You have to change your view of infinity so you can walk it in one step. This entire realm is a number line. You know that it is impossible to reach infinity by traversing the number line. However, you can also reach infinity by traveling from one to two. This is because there are also infinite number of small numbers. The decimals can go on and on, and in fact, there are infinite number of numbers between any two numbers. So in some ways, you have already traveled infinity. So this time, when you take another step, you fall through the ground and everything turns black. Welcome to part three, the world of infinity. You find yourself lying face up in the grass in a pleasant light park. You feel slightly confused. Are the uncountable years of walking nonstop over? You cautiously stand up to look around. Buildings, automobiles, street lamps, library shops, people. Your mind is so distracted by the cityscape being directly presented in front of you that you almost fail to notice the person standing a couple meters beside you. One of the most fundamental and intuitive properties of infinity is that it is boundless. Unlike finite quantities, which have a beginning and an end point, infinity has no limit or boundary. However, this is only one of the intuitive properties of infinity. One counterintuitive idea about infinity is that there are different sizes of, of infinity. This can feel implausible because of, the previous uh, because of the previous idea of infinity's boundlessness, evoking the question of how something that goes on forever can be bested. This is quite like claiming an unlimited storage container can run out of storage, which seems impossible to do. Another counter to property of infinity is that the conception that a part can equal to a whole. 
Again, with finite numbers, this cannot be the case. Yet with infinity, you can find this phenomenon everywhere, like with even and whole numbers. Even though the even numbers are just a part of the whole number, there are infinite many of both. Remember that person that was standing beside you? Well, he looks at you from head to toe and says it's best for you to take a rest. When you ask him where, he replies that the Hilbert Hotel is quite, a cozy, is quite cozy and is only 15 blocks down and one block to the left. He departs and you give him a thanks. Hilbert's Hotel is modest looking, radiating coziness. However, once you open the door, you are presented with a grand lobby filled with thousands of receptionists and tens of thousands of people. You walk up to a receptionist telling her that you would like to have a night stay. So she bucks you up for room number four million and sends you down the hotel hallway. And after a while of walking, you finally find your room only to collapse on its very soft bed. One famous thought experiment that was made to better understand the concept of infinity is David Hilbert's Hilbert Hotel Paradox. Consider a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, labeled from one, two, three, all the way to infinity. Now there's a person occupied in each room, so there are an infinite number of people in an infinite number of rooms. And at first it might seem like the hotel wouldn't be able to accommodate any guests, but that is the only the case with a finite number of rooms. Suppose a new guest arrives and wishes for this, a stay. Although all rooms are occupied, we can actually accommodate this guest. What we do is we tell every guest through the PA to move down a room. So the guest currently in room one goes to room two, the guest in room two goes to room three, and so on. And after this, the new guest can move to the available room one. And by repeating this procedure, we can move any infinite number of guests, any finite number of guests into our hotel. Assuming n is the number of guests arriving, we can just tell everybody to move to the room number plus n and move the rest of the guests to the new available in rooms. Now, let's suppose that the hotel has two infinite floors and every guest on the second floor needed to evacuate onto the first floor. So now there are infinitely many people wishing for a stay to the first floor. To accommodate this much people, we can tell every guest in the first floor to move to the room double the room number. So the room one guest moves from room one to room two, the guest from room two moves to room three, the guest from room three moves to room six, and so on. It's easy for the guests in smaller rooms, but not so easy for the guests in room number 4,205. <laughs> After this, all the odd number rooms are available. And since we know there are an infinite number of odd numbers, we can just move everybody from the second floor onto the first floor with a unique odd number room. However, what if the hotel had an infinite number of infinite floors, which all needed to evacuate to the first floor. Still, we can actually manage to fit every single person onto the first floor. The easiest way to do so is to make an infinite spreadsheet. Each row represents each guest's floor number, and each column represents each guest's room number. So you have floor one, room one, floor one, room two, floor one, room three, etc., and floor two, room one, floor two, room two, and so on up all the floors and down all the rooms. Each person now, each person is in all the now each person in all the floors can be found in the spread within in within the spreadsheet, and to assign all the rooms, we can draw a zigzag that crosses out every guest on the infinite spreadsheet once. Then all we have to do is assign each guest to the room number in that order. Now at this point you might feel unstoppable. That is when a mini van mini van arrives. The driver steps out of the driver's seat and asks for a place to stay. So you ask him how many people are inside the minivan. But after he responds, you realize that you couldn't fit his family into the Hilbert's Hotel. And this is why. Each person in his family is named as every number between one and zero. So there'll be a person in his family that is named that or that, or any possible combination of every digit repeated an infinite number of times. So that means even if you pair every single person in his family with a hotel room, you are still able to write down the name of a person in his family that does not have a room. The way you do this is you first take the first digit of the first name and change it, the second digit of the second name and change it, the third digit of the third name and change it, and so on. If you repeat this process all the way down the diagonal, then the name you write down is guaranteed to not have a room because it wouldn't match the first, uh, first, digit, uh, first digit of first name, the second digit of second name, the third digit of third name, and so on. And even if we pair this number with a room, we can repeat this process again, an infinite num uh, again to find a number without a room, and do so an infinite number of times to find an infinite number of people without a room. The Hilbert's Hotel is finally defeated. 
You shake your head and sigh sadly at the driver while you dismiss his family from your hotel. As you watch the driver leave, you lean back onto your chair as you stare at the ceiling, contemplating the true size of Hilbert's hotel, but most importantly, the true size of the driver's minivan, an infinity larger than the Hilbert's hotel. Through this paradox, we learn that a part can sometimes equal to a whole. Although we, le we learn that although the first floor is just a part of the entire hotel, it can still fit the same amount of people as the entire hotel itself. What the Hilbert's Hotel also proves to us is how some infinities are equal and others can be larger. As represented in the paradox, the infinite set of fractions, which is represented by the infinite floors, is equal to the infinite set of, infinite set of natural numbers because each fraction can be paired with a natural number. But the infinite set of irrational numbers is way larger than infinite set of natural numbers because each set of irrational numbers cannot be paired with the natural number. You can always find a number without a partner. In fact, not only are there a couple different sizes of infinity, someone called Georg Cantor proved that there are an infinite numbers of infinity of different sizes. This is because Cantor showed that for any infinite set of numbers, forming a new set made of all the subsets of the original set would represent a larger infinity than the previous set. And this means that once you have one infinity, you can always make a bigger one by making, by making the set of all subsets of the first set, and an even bigger one by making the set of all subsets of that set, and so on. What? I don't even understand. Anyways, you awoke to a ray of the morning sun beaming you in the face through your uncurtained window. You toss your blanket aside and start to dress yourself up. However, something doesn't feel right. This room, the bed, and even the sun. Your mind begins to place that you are not in Hobart's Hotel anymore. Yet this room still gl uh, radiates glaring familiarity, poking at the back of your head. You walk out of the room to have a look around as you scour your forgotten memory bank, trying to find out where you are. The deeper you look, the more you see, the more you see, the more you become aware, the more you become aware, the more you realize that you are in your house, the house that your past self lived in before you took on this journey. However, it means you have now completed your journey. You decide to open your front door to take a morning walk. The smell of fresh air, the sun, you forgot the qualities of your home planet. It was so long ago before you walked the number line. It should have driven you insane, a tortured soul mindlessly wandering an internal plane. Yet you feel the opposite, like you were guided by some spirit carving your path to enlightenment. You silently recap your adventure. At the beginning of the journey, we start with the most fundamental concepts in mathematics, the number zero. And from there, we learn the history of the numerical system as it progressed to compensate for more larger, for the use of more larger and more complex numbers. As our voyage continues, we encounter larger numbers that surpass the limits of, u of the universe. Here, we learn about the absurdities of numbers and how reality bending the scale of these numbers really are. Despite the wild claims that attempt to convey the size of these beasts, we will tr never truly comprehend and encounter such size. And at the end of our journey, we encounter one of the most fascinating and mysterious concepts in mathematics. We explore infinity and the intuitive and mostly counterintuitive properties of infinity as we learn about the famous thought experiment that really emphasized the absurdities of infinity. The journey of infinity is a journey of discovery. It reminds us of the small limit of the human mind. However, by acknowledging this limit, we push this limit further. Recognizing just how small we are, recognizing just how small we are, makes us understand this large universe surrounding us. First of all, I would like to thank um, Jen for being an amazing Masterworks coordinator and helping keep me and others on task while editing everybody's paper as well. Additionally, I would also like to thank my Masterworks advisor, Pam and John, for providing me with resources, help clarify my knowledge, help mentor me through this whole process, through feedback, as well as editing and fact-checking my work. I would also like to thank my parents for supporting me along the way as well as provide me with valuable time for me to work on my masterwork. And finally, I would like to thank you guys for being an attentive and respectful audience. Seriously, if it weren't for these people, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here standing, I wouldn't be standing here today. So thank you very much. Thank you.
incredible uh, presentation. Your energy, your enthusiasm for numbers, I've seen for a long time, and it's really nice that everyone else can see your enthusiasm. So we're going to start question period, of which there are probably a lot. <laughs> we're going to start with uh, Pam Matthews, your faculty advisor, and I think she has one from John too. Mr. Lee, that was absolutely incredible. I have done a lot of masterworks in my time, over my time at IPS. This has been the most challenging one for me, and I've done some crazy ones. I've done DNA editing and fractals and cancer treatments and all kinds of things, and you really pushed me to understand a whole bunch of stuff. I still needed you to clarify stuff about Hilbert Total, but I'm starting to get it because you're such an amazing teacher. I felt like I was in a university uh, lecture, only yours was way more fun than any lecture I've ever been to. Way more interesting. I have a question from John, your advisor who is on the Sunshine Coast. He said, how did your perception of the concept of infinity change from before you started? Well, I mean, at first, like, it started when, like, a while ago, I clicked on, like, some YouTube video that said, that explained some stuff about infinity and how one infinity can be larger. And then I was kind of, like, I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh, but infinity is infinity. It just mm -hmm. it can't be larger because infinity and blah, 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 right? And, but then as I'm, but throughout this year, I've been, like, learning other stuff about infinity. And, like, it just, it broadened me to a new world. It was, it was kind of, I don't know, maybe like enlightening or something like that. Like it put me into a new perspective about this number that we can actually like somewhat understand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool finding the paradox of infinity too is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, this is my question. Um, you set out to do a project about big numbers, which you did an incredible job, and you learned so much more than you even have in your in your presentation. So you did a whole section on probability that was just absolutely mind blowing and a lot of fun. So I think people should uh, read your paper because you've got incredible stuff in there. Um, uh, Sorry, but you had a bunch of really challenging, mind-bending concepts. I mean, I think you worked through infinity, but in the end you found it kind of simple. But there were some concepts that were really challenging. Was there one that really stood out that you had to work through, and how did you do that? What was your learning process? Uh, there's like a couple. Mostly it's like getting like lesser, it's like, it's mostly in the storyline. Uh, and well, like there, there was one one problem where I like spent a lot of time on is like what would an infinite flat plane actually look like? And like I did a bunch of researching, and it turns out an infinite flat plane would actually look like a hollow sphere, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Um, I. Yeah, that's yeah. I probably I shouldn't get more into it, but it's like it's about how like the gravity bends light and blah blah blah. It's a whole yeah. other masterwork. Um, Can you tell me your favorite probability? Do you remember one of the one of the good probabilities you had? There was one you made up that was about your classmates. Oh, like there's like a probability of like I I, I forgot the number, but like it's like it's a big number. Well, it's actually <laughs> it's it's. I don't know, but like the probability of all my classmates dying of cancer is like I don't know. It's like it's like it's like a trillion or something like that. One in a trillion, uh, maybe less. I don't know, or more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, and my first question is: Would you like to be a guest lecturer in my class? <laughs> it was really cool to have you. Uh, talk about some of the things that I've talked mostly, well, scientific notation in grade seven, but the concept of numbers uh, was really so well explained by you. And what I love most about your paper and your presentation is that you went to the philosophical side of things and where you were using it sort of like as a thought experiment. And the, how you located it in the story without going down a road 
made it really accessible for a lot of students in the audience and also for me. So thank you for that because I felt like I knew a little bit more by the end. You woke, you did enlighten me. It opened up a whole new world that I didn't know existed. We all need to be. So that was really um, exceptional for me. So questions from the audience. If you have your hand up, please, Samir, can you come to here and ask your question? Come up. Uh, first think about, it was a long time ago, and then I found out that if I keep on adding one, like a really long time ago, like when I was really small, if you keep on, you can always like make a bigger number by adding one to it. And then I found that like really cool, like people say, and if, and I'm like, I, I, will, I would ask people, and they're like, oh, what's the biggest number you can think of that? And then they say a number, and they'll be like, oh, but my number's <laughs> larger because my number's that number plus one. Junior <laughs> <laughs> uh, agrees with that. Uh, Steve, can you stand up and ask it loud, please? Sure. Do you know of any other creature on Earth, any member of the animal kingdom, that understands even a few numbers? Can you think of any? Because I'm sure they can, but I think they must. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe like the smart animals, like dolphins or like maybe monkeys. Uh, and I didn't really research into that part, but then I'm, I, I'd say yes, because I think I've seen like a few clips of like monkeys counting or something like that. They definitely like under some, some, some definitely understand the concept of numbers. I've seen like a monkey do a chimps test and then there's numbers involved in that test. So yeah. Very good, thank you. I think so, I maybe, I did not research into that, but then like some mathematicians, they just like to know about stuff because it's just cool, and then they, they just want to learn more. It, I know like infinity is used in calculus a lot, and then calculus is also used a lot, so that, I guess that's my answer to your question, yeah. <laughs> Infinity is kind of like... Because infinity uh -huh. means infinity, no end, right? So if there's larger infinities and smaller infinities, wouldn't they just all equal each other? <laughs> no, because I explained in the previous one, it is kind of confusing, but you, there's something called a bijection, which we pair two different infinities to each other and see if we can pair every number in that set to uh, a corresponding different number, and then what? When and then sometimes, and that's used to prove that the irrational numbers are larger than natural numbers, because you can always you can you can do a trick that makes that that finds a number that irrational number that isn't paired with a natural number, so it represents that those sets of numbers have a different cardinality, which is like a fancy term used for like the size of a set. <laughs> so there are different sizes of infinity. Yeah, that's, yeah. Do you want? Well done, Ms. Billy. Um, I have a question, because you said earlier that there's like infinity between one and two, like in one step. Is there also infinity in between like one to 1.1, 1 .1, like zero to 0 0.2? Yeah, like, uh, like technically, I guess it, no, not really, but like, I guess you can count it as infinity. But basically, there are an infinite number of numbers between any re two real numbers, and then those numbers between the numbers they add up to infinity. <laughs> 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 Fantastic job, Mr. It was very good, and it was very nice to have a visual.
legislation as well as just speaking it. Um, my question to you is, after doing all this research, learning a good bit of prob probabilities, but as well as all this stuff that you've done in your presentation, do you see yourself maybe following this path as a career and like looking at more <coughs> in depth? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Mathematics usually drive people insane, and like, um, <laughs> <laughs> and like those theoretical physicists and like stuff like that. Uh, it is like a cool topic to do. Maybe like maybe maybe mathematics, maybe physics, physics, or something like that. It, it is like seems like a pretty cool career. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Very important question. What is your favorite number? Uh, <laughs> I I guess it's zero. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. I'm curious, uh, in the course of your year-long investigation and journey towards infinity, if you ever came across anyone of those uh, that have been studying this maybe their whole life that, that considered infinity to be more simply just one. Uh, I guess you can like view it like that, uh, but like you can view this. Infinity is just like kind of like it's kind of like a group of numbers, right? And then the smallest infinity can be viewed as one, while like other larger infinities can be viewed as like twenty-four or something like that. They have, uh, I think, a measuring measurement system by like the Aleph numbers or something like that. And Aleph naught is basically the smallest type of infinity, and it goes Aleph one, Aleph two, Aleph three, Aleph four, all the way to Aleph infinity. <laughs> Actually, I don't know, but like it goes. Keep on. It, it goes very. It, it keeps on going forever and forever. So, like within an infinity, there's like. Yeah, I get your point, you know, and I'm just curious too, yeah, because maybe, maybe it can. There can just be one infinite. <laughs> I. I think this guy, like the the same Georg Cantor guy who proved that there were. An infinite amount of infinities. He like, it's not, it's, it's not like, it's not proved. But then he just mentioned the idea of absolute infinity, which is like the biggest infinity, and you can't go beyond it. But then he just said that because he wanted to say that, and there was like no proof <laughs> behind that. You don't have to. <laughs> that Good. No proof. What? Yeah. Hey, what? In your opinion, what is the smallest infinity? It, I, I guess maybe like an infinitesimal, like one over infinity, which is basically like, and what's cool is, that's like a whole new section because there's, it's also in calculus, it like made calculus infinitesimals. Um, Yeah, so, but, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Shield, Congratulations, that was very riveting. I'm not one for numbers, but I stayed awake through that entire thing. <laughs> That's the of it, so congratulations. Um, when you were doing your research, what was the most mind-blowing discovery for you? I was, like, playing around with ChatGPT a bit, and then it turns out that, um, so the set of prime numbers and the set of composite numbers, they're the same infinity, right? So a prime number would be like two, three, five, and the composite numbers would be four, four, eight, 16, or something like that. And then, but the probability of selecting a composite number over a prime number is it's the same? Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's different. It's more likely to select a comp. Like if you take a bunch of numbers, just like an infinite amount of numbers, and then you select a random number, the probability of it being composite is really high. But they are the same size as a pin. And what's even cooler is if you pair those two sets together, 
then the, you pair those two sets together. So you match each prime with a composite number, and you select a number again, the probability of selecting composite would only be 50%. So like you can arrange <laughs> different sets and then you can like it's it's weird. Mind blowing. Mac, it is mind blowing and not just weird, it's incredible. <laughs> and you made it very accessible. So I'm gonna conclude the questions here. Uh, because you've done such an excellent job of really going even deeper than what I thought was pretty deep in your presentation. So well done, a round of applause. <laughs>
Pacific School. Hello everyone at Island Pacific School. We are almost ready for our next presentation, but I have a very important announcement before we do that. And that is that Max Lee has met all the requirements of the master's program at Adam Civic School. <laughs> and now I'd like to welcome you back to our Masterworks presentations for 2023. We are in our 28th year of Masterworks. And for those who have just joined us, I wanted to welcome you and also say that there are some traditions we call our grade nine students by their last names and that we are going to be having masterworks presentations throughout the entire week. So please stay tuned. We are live streaming on our YouTube channel and uh, everyone can join us from their homes also. Is there anything we need to fix before? Just the volume a little bit. But you can't hear me? Yeah, we've got some members too. Okay, so can everyone hear us now? Yeah, pretty much, okay. So this is a culmination of a year's worth of effort by our grade nine students. At this point, they have written a 20 to 30 page paper that is of the topic of their choosing. So this is really important that they choose something that they're interested in, that can, can sustain them for an entire year, but also it could be something that they grow with and maybe uh, do something with later on in their life. So uh, we are gonna have the presentation and then we have a question period after that. So get your questions ready and we'll call you up for that after. The grade nines are the experts in the room at this point and our newest minted expert is Ms. Vera Esteva Carena. Please welcome her. <laughs> Hello, my name is Vera, and welcome to my master's presentation. I'll be sharing with you what I learned during my master's project in IPS. If you couldn't tell by the opening slide and my photo, my master's is on pottery. I know a lot of you think that pottery is just a passion that gets you very dirty and wrecks your clothes, and you'd be right, but it's not only that. <laughs> There's a rich history and culture behind it too, and I'll be talking about that today. So I'll be talking a bit about myself and why I chose pottery, and then I'll spend time talking about the history of pottery and the materials used to make ceramics. And finally, talk about my personal experience in making pottery. I come from a long line of makers, designers, and people interested in pottery and beauty. My mom's side is from Britain and Canada, and my dad's side is from Argentina and by extension, Italy. <laughs> I know that's not my dad, but I knew I couldn't talk about my heritage without my seat. <laughs> in the family, there's a strong interest in making things. My Canadian grandfather built houses in Saudi Arabia, USA, Canada, and um, Uruguay. My British grandmother was a model and held female CEOs as a fashion consultant. My, my Argentine grandfather was a mechanical and chemical engineer. He worked building machinery for many different industries. My uh, Argentine Italian grandmother knits, cooks, and much more on demand. <laughs> my dad and my uncles are all designers of different kinds, like fashion, graphic design, technical animation, and design studio owners. My aunt used to be a model in Europe, and my uncle is a creator and producer of video games. Since I was really young, I was always interested in making things with my hands. I enjoyed creating new things and especially useful things. I wonder where I got my interest in design. Um, I could do this with friends, family, and people I love. In school, I signed up for a pottery class when I was in grade three and four. I found so much joy in it and it was an outlet for my creativity. Last year, I, joined, I wanted to join a pottery class, but I had a very busy schedule as four, so I took the opportunity to make the subject of my masterwork to for my project, I focus on pottery because you can make incredible things with very limited materials. You can make quite literally anything with practice and it'll turn out beautiful. You can also make pottery to be as a function or used as decoration. 
what is pottery anyway? According to the dictionary, pottery is the process and products of forming vessels and other objects with clay and raw materials. You might see me say ceramics as well, but um, pottery and ceramics are one and the same. The word ceramic derives from Greek, which translates of pottery or for pottery. What about pottery in history? Surprisingly, almost every civilization used pottery. This is because it was accessible and a universal thing everyone wanted to use. Making pottery was a very effective way of producing durable and long-lasting products. Pottery is so old that we actually don't know how old it is, but we can make some estimates um, according to some of the found artifacts. Here we have a timeline of some of the most old pottery pieces from some of the most significant cultures. First, we have Venus of Dolny as a Bestonis. This piece was the oldest pottery artifact discovered. It, may, it was made in 29,000 BC and was discovered in what is now the Czech Republic. This piece was first found in two different pieces and was then attached back together very recently. This next example was found in China. It was made in 17,982 BC and it was only a small piece of a bigger artifact. We have only found this piece a couple more and a couple more that had been from the same artifact, but we don't have enough pieces to conjoin it back together. 35,000 BC was when the first party, 3,500 BC was when the first uh, party, pottery wheel was invented. It was found in Egypt, though a lot of studies show that there were other cultures that had variations of the wheel as well. This means that all the pottery before 3,500 BC was made by hand. 700 BC was when black figure style was found in Greece. Signif it was a significant style of Greek culture. They depicted mythical matter, battle scenes, and other figure-heavy figure portrayals. Three, 332 BC was when the goddess Isis and her son Horus pottery piece was created. It was, a, it was a part of significant Egyptian finance style, which we'll talk about later. This piece had an impact in Rome and where there was a cult built for Isis. This artifact was a symbol of rebirth. You might be wondering, how is that piece so blue? Um, the, how did the Egyptians get such a blue color so long ago? They'd only got this color when they first started mining. The Egyptians found small amounts of copper, and they were selling it for a lot. The copper was incorporated with clay, quartz, and other minerals. The copper later oxidizes and creating this amazing blue that you see. The, these pieces were li really expensive, so they were only used to decorate tombstones and stuff. Um, I, will I will now be talking about the three different types of pottery. Earthenware pottery, um, earthenware pottery has a warm and earthy look to it. It absorbs water easily and has a very thick consistency. It is the weakest of the clays. Older earthenware clays were found in China, dating back to 18,000 years old. Stoneware pottery is denser than earthenware. It is stronger than earthenware, but not the strongest. The, thickest, the thickness and density is in between earthenware and porcelain. Oldest stoneware potteries were found in China, dating back 3,400 years old. Porcelain is very dense and can be stretched out to very thin pieces. It is very durable and is a long-lasting material, resistant to chipping, scratching, and staining. Porcelain is usually white and translucent and has a smooth, non-stick surfaces. The oldest porcelain pottery was found in China, dating back 20,000 years old. Uh, here you can see that I've listed the different types of pottery from the weakest to the strongest, from least expensive to most expensive, from thinnest to thickest, and so on. Here you can see that I have the different types of clay. And you might be thinking, well, didn't we just talk about this? Let's move on already. That's exactly what I was thinking during this part of my masterworks. Um, uh, my dad helped me find out that there was apparently a, differ a difference between the types of pottery and the types of clay. Well, some genius decided to name them the exact same thing. Um, the finished product that is made from earthenware clay is called earthenware pottery, which sounds obvious now that I say it out loud. I will now talk about the materials inside the different types of clay. Earthenware clays are, were some of the earliest clays used by potters, and it was the most common type of clay. Clays are easily worked and can be sticky. Earthenware clays contain iron and other mineral impurities. Now you can find clay from the ground in areas where streams or rivers once flowed. So stoneware clays are gray and when, mo and, when moist and when moist, and their fired colors range through light gray and brown. Fired colors are greatly affected by the types of firing. Colon is used in porcelain pottery. It is very light in color. Colon is a powder used in porcelain and is actually really good for clearing up acne as well. Fire clays are suitable for lining surfaces as fire bricks. These insulate the inside of a kiln, for example, to make the firing process more efficient. 
Ball clays cannot be used by themselves because they shrink a lot during the firing and drying stages. However, they are very useful when added to other clays. Ball clays make the clay more workable and easier to use. Pottery on the wheel. The wheel is a tool where most pottery is done. It is a spinning table where clay is shaped with their hands and some special tools. Here I'll show you them in action so I can show you what it looks like. Here you'll see this is the shape that he'll make. And as you can tell, the water is the clay. It's very, very wet clay. Um, and yeah, uh, the water is added to make it easier for your hands to go through it instead of um, sticking to the piece and it just glides over it instead. Uh, here we have uh, tools on the wheel. This is done to give pottery pieces a more defined shape. It avoids dampness on the side of the bowl. Trimming your pieces makes them smooth and pleasant to hold. When you first finish a pottery piece, you have a flat bottom. When you trim your piece, you define the bottom, caving in the bottom to make a foot. As you can see in the top photo, the bottom of the bowl is completely flat, and in the second bowl, the foot is actually caved in. This is a feature in almost all pottery pieces that are made on the wheel. When you trim your walls of your piece, you soften them, making it easier for the glaze to stay on. And here you can see what he's going to trim off and what he's going to it is really, really satisfying. Uh, but this is done to make it much softer. And this is done after you've created your piece and left it to dry, not after you've already fired it. Needle tool. Thi I use this tool for a lot of different things. We'll make designs to trim off, uh, to make designs and to trim off the tops of my pieces. When you first um, create your pottery piece, the tops of your pieces aren't exactly equal all throughout. So you can trim it off to make it all the same. You can also pop air holes in your pieces because if you have air holes, your um, pieces will crack uh, in the film. This tool is pretty self-explanatory. I use it to cut my clay, though when you make a piece on the wheel, you scrape this tool on the surface of the wheel and separate it and take it off. Here, this guy is going to demonstrate how you cut the clay. you got to make sure you hold it very well or else it'll fling off to the side. And here is a demonstration of how you dis extract your piece of pottery from the wheel. Got to make sure you do it very slowly because once I made my piece of clay fall off the wheel, like flying off, which is great. Um, there you go. It's very cool. And then here we have a metal rib. I use this tool to scrape off any excess water off the sides of my pieces, uh, though that's making pieces on the wheel. You scrape off any excess water because if there's a lot of water left on your piece, um, it will explode or crack in the kiln. This is because the water evaporates in the kiln and causes breakage in the pottery. It is also because if it firms up your piece. If you were to leave a soaking wet pottery piece out, it will probably slop over. As you can see in this one, she smooths out the bottom and it's much of the piece. Also very satisfying. Um, Sponges. The sponge is pretty self-explanatory as well. Uh, there are a lot of different instances where you can um, Here, he uses the sponge to soften the walls, and the walls come out smoother if you use the sponge than your fingers. And, yeah. Can you make pottery without the wheel? Uh, for shapes that cannot be made by rotation, there are other ways to shape the clay. And here are some examples that you can make clay with. Uh, here we have slip casting. Slip casting is when you, um, you basically make a mold of whatever you'd like to cast and you make it out of silicone. Uh, when the mold is made, you pour slip into the mold. Slip is a mixture of clay and water mixed together and it's very thick consistency. When you drain the mold, leaving a thin layer of clay on the sides of the mold. When the clay has dried, you separate the mold, revealing the piece that you've made. So this saves a lot of time and it makes it so that you have very equal pieces. There are two different types of molds that you can have, the ones that you just slip out the piece like that, or you can have molds where you take them apart in two different sections. Then you just later glaze them and fire them as well. We have coil building. When making coil pots, you roll your clay into a long snake-looking noodle, and then you wet the sides of the piece to make it easier to shape. You then use your fingers or flat as you can see, the inside of the pot is completely flat and the outside is more wiggly like a little caterpillar. Um, and you just attach them together to make them all even. And yeah, that's it.
comes out with a really cool pop that you can use later for plants or something. Uh, then we have slab work. Uh, to make slab pottery, you typically have measurements to make it, or you can freehand the piece. You cut out flat pieces of clay and attach them to each other. Here's a representation of me making slab work. Um, here, oh, oh my god. Okay, um, I basically carved little bits on the sides of the pieces and I attached them to other pieces and that's how you make slab work. Um, when, ooh, sorry. Uh, firing techniques and glazes. When you finish your oven called a kiln, this hardens your piece, making it available to use. You later glaze them. There are thousands of different techniques of glazing and some firing techniques, and that's what I'll talk about next. We fire our pieces to make them hard. It's like cooking meat. You can't eat uncooked meat just like how you can't use unfired pottery. We have uh, different techniques of firing our soda firing, rocky firing, and sawdust firing. Soda firing is when you put baking soda and sodium carbonate into a kiln. As it reaches a temperature of about 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit, when both of the, these elements are introduced to the kiln at this temperature, they will vaporize and disperse throughout the kiln. This vapor then adheres to the pottery within the kiln, creating a high, highly textured glaze. Because the vapors are unpredictable, your finished, looks, uh, your finished piece looks like a beautiful surprise, so there's no way of telling what your piece will look like at the end. Uh, Raku firing involves removing the pottery from the kiln when it's red hot. The piece is then placed in a container with paper or sawdust, which catches fire, creating an oxygen reduction environment that yields unpredictable but unique results. This cooling process can be completed in a number of ways and can even create a crackle design on finished pieces. Sawdust firing involves a kiln that you make yourself with bricks or stones placed together. You then pack the inside of this cave with sawdust, place your pottery on top, and then put more sawdust on the pieces. This type of firing can take up to 36 hours. The piece will come out of this firing method, usually smoky black or other dark colors. Once the pottery is finished, a natural glaze or wax can be applied. Here's a video of how raku firing is done. It adds the paper inside and then it adds the piece and if you place sawdust on top and just leaves it there to cool in. We use glazes as a layer piece. This layer of protection makes them dishwasher safe, soft, and soft. When a pottery piece is taken straight out of the kiln, it is ashy and not really pleasant to hold. Uh, when a layer of glaze is added to them, it makes them soft, dishwasher safe, and pleasant to grab as well. We use glazes to make them look pretty as well, just like how you guys decorated pieces at the burrow. Dipping, for this method, you simply dip your ceramic piece into a bucket of glaze. Pretty simple type of technique. Pouring and dripping. This technique is exactly what it sounds. You either drip or pour glaze over your piece. They're technically the same, but uh, dripping is less glaze being put on your piece. Brushing. This is one of the most common ones where you just brush glaze onto your piece. Splatting is more of a fun way to decorate your pottery. You just splatter glaze onto it. Um, and then we have sponging. This is a method where you just make um, little textures on your pot. And you basically create streaks, bumps, and many different textures. Glaze trailing is a technique made of glaze on glaze or glaze on clay artworks by drawing. The glaze trailing is used to produce a natural and abstract artwork on pottery pieces. A little squishable stack and just glaze comes out and you can make whatever textures and t um, patterns you'd like. Wax resist is my personal favorite. Uh, this is when you add wax into your ceramic piece and then you dip it in glaze. When you put the piece in the kiln, the wax burns off and leaves the clay visible and leaves a really cool design. My finished products. So with excellent uh, instructions, whoop, instructions and patience from Catherine Epps, my external advisor, I worked at the borough on my pieces. Here are all of them that I made. So first we have my cap plate. This is the first piece I ever made. Um, it was the first slab work as well. This is air dry clay, so it was not glazed at all. Um, here we have my flower bowl. This one was not very uh, successful. This was more of an exper uh, experiment that I made. Um, as you can see, you can't really tell that I carved anything in it because I didn't make the carving too thick. 
it's my lily bowl, so present for my mom. Uh, it's the first time glazing anything, and it's my first time making designs with glaze as well. Um, basically, this one was a piece that I matched with another piece, which is my other wavy cup that had Kiki's Delivery Service cat in it. Um, and then we have, uh, this piece was basically, it was just like a matching set that I made. And then this one is my first time making a handle. I feel like I handled it pretty well. <laughs> and then, <laughs> it's, it's my last two ones are made out of air dry clay. Uh, they're the first ones. Um, this one I thought was kind of funny. It's my first face that I made on the cup. Um, yeah, it, was, it holds my jewelry and stuff. I would say he does a pretty good job. Um, and then this one is my first scenery that I made. It's two little mushrooms. It was very dusty because it's hot dust, like sitting on my shelves and stuff. Um, so sadly, none of these can be glazed to air dry. So um, you can paint them with acrylic, but you can't really glaze them because they can't go in the kiln. This is my face mug. I did this for an art project for Adrian, wherever Adrian is. And um, basically, the idea behind this cup was uh, to hold a tea bag in the mouth because my mom never actually puts tea bags in the garbage, she just puts them in the sink. Um, <laughs> so I put this one to put the tea bag inside of the actual mug. And then these last two ones are ones that are um, not exactly finished yet because they're still in the baking process. So this one I haven't glazed yet and this one is still being cooked right now. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Thank you so much. I would like to, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and now this is the end of my presentation. I would like to say uh, my acknowledgments before we watch our uh, next presentation. I'd like to first thank Julie for helping me through this, my first presentation, and I'd like to thank Jen for getting mad at me when I always got distracted. I would like to thank Catherine S. for teaching me absolutely everything I know, and I apologize for the photo. I couldn't find anything. Um, and thank you for seeing me on the worst sides of those early morning um, master's presentations. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful job um, today. I know that there's a lot of patience and work and learning involved in this entire process, and I learned with you through the entire process. I think that's what I got. Um, my question is, is that you started with a completely different topic, and you now are a master in pottery. But how, you mentioned multiple times that this was almost spiritual for you and it was, you said multiple times in the video that it was satisfactory and it was so fun for you to actually do this process. How did you feel making pottery? Because you talked about multiple different ways, strategies and techniques, but what, what was involved in your process while you were creating pottery? Okay. Um. So yeah, I forgot to add this in my presentation, but um, when on my first day of coming up to the borough, I was talking with Catherine, and we were just uh, working with our clay, and Catherine was like, you gotta speak to your clay. And I was like, what? Um, <laughs> and they were like, no, yeah, if you speak to her very nicely, you got this connection with the clay, and if you um, 
if you treat it nicely, then it'll give you a piece back to, like, a very beautiful piece to remind that of what you did with that uh, clay. And at first I was like, okay, that's like, I don't know. Um, so, but I did it, you know, and it turned out pretty well. I liked it, it was kind of fun. And um, actually Julie made me aware that minerals inside of the clay are actually part minerals in your body. So um, that also has a connection with you as well, so yeah. Very well done. Yeah. Uh, very impressive. Thank you. Oh, got moved. <laughs> um, great video, and um, I just, uh, you kind of took my question. <laughs> but I guess, um, I'm really glad you connect. I'm just wondering what they're going to find your pots like 35,000 years from now, and what they're going to oh, say. Yeah. It's, <laughs> um, it's obviously meant something to you. If you were going to give someone advice, like if they wanted to do some pottery, how would you advise them? What would you say to them? Okay, two things. Uh, probably take it slow because at first I really wanted to like make my pottery and also do research before you do. Uh, make pottery really quickly, but then I learned that you have to like take it slow before if you want to make anything good. And also, uh, wear clothes you don't want to erect. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much advice that I would give you. Thank you. Well done. Pursuing the soccer shed. <laughs> um, no, not really. To be honest, I really liked making pottery, so it was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I don't feel like the shed would have been done in time, mostly because of my very busy schedule. But I feel like this one was a perfect amount of time for me to do stuff, and it was very fun, so I feel like the pottery shed, not the pottery shed, the soccer shed <laughs> would have been uh, a lot of time that would have taken up, and it wouldn't have been very fun, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it also ran into some logistical things with housing that we could not overcome. Yeah. Is there a Great job, Mrs. Uh, Miss Escobar. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is my my voice. Okay, but uh, great, great job, great job, great presentation. <laughs> Fascinating me a lot. Um, I have, my question is, when there was a time when I did pottery, and then like most of the times 
when I like try and try and try the wheel, sometimes like the 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 clay would break and snap off. I wonder if that happened to you, and if it did, how many how many tries did it take to like make your finished products? Okay, so that happened like multiple times actually. So the reason why that like is because I pulled it out too thin, and it just, the, the clay was the wrong clay to be doing that. The, usually the best clay to do that with is porcelain because it can be thinned out really, really long. Um, but I think I was using uh, snowware and it didn't exactly work very well in my favor. Uh, it happened multiple times, but I did end up working with it and I ended up making more thick pieces. Uh, here you can see that this is much, much thinner than this. And this piece was like one of the times I learned not to make it so thin. pretty simple so it didn't it took relatively like when I first started it it would take like I don't know how long like 20 minutes to make one piece yeah, just practice. yeah I just kept on practicing until I got it but um, this one bowl that I did I left for lunch to do it and it took me like 10 minutes to do it and it was a pretty big bowl I ended up smashing it later because I couldn't cook it but um, yeah it was it took me like 10 minutes or something so yeah just to make it yeah, just to make it, then the later process take like very, very long. Um I have two questions for you. First is when you're going into like the using the pottery wheel, because I've heard it's like kinda of hard to use, like um, did you think it was gonna be easy and then you like crumbled and it was kinda of hard or like did you well, know it was hard? At first when I got there, I first I thought that we were gonna take like three classes, like Oh, I'm gonna teach you this, I'm gonna teach you that. And we did it. And it just like as soon as I got out there, Catherine handed me clay and she was like, Come on, let's go on the wheel. I was like, Oh, okay. So um, I feel like it was relatively like pretty easy not easy, because obviously just kind of cool like that. And I don't know, I just I feel like it was could have been harder in a way that she helped me, like she guided me through a lot and she was there with me most of the time. So yeah. Um, my second question for you is, do you see yourself as, like, in the future as an artistic kind of, like, pottery kind of thing, in a way? Uh, I would say so. I feel like it would be very fun to, like, you know, own my own, like, pottery studio. I feel like that'd be really cool. But, yeah, I feel like I would probably be doing art then. Very cool. see by your presentation and seeing you through the years that you've learned an incredible, incredible amount and developed tremendously in a very difficult skill, I believe. My question for you is, as an art teacher, I think art teaches us a lot about life, lessons that we bring into life that may not seem directly related, um, but I think are great things to bring with us. And my question to you is, what did you learn through your process doing pottery, or what can pottery teach you that you can take into life? What life lessons can you learn from this art form? Um, so that's kind of a hard question. Um, I would say, I don't, I don't know actually, but I really like the fact that something about a lot of passions is that you don't really have time to like connect with people while you're doing the thing. Like for soccer, for example, you're running all the time, you can't really be talking or anything. And the thing about pottery is that you can talk during like pottery and you can listen to music and stuff. So it's kind of like a thing where you get to connect with people while making your own thing. And while you make that, later you have a piece to remember that moment that you had connecting with someone else. I feel like that would be probably a life lesson, I guess. Like, live in the moment? Yeah. That's a great lesson. Thank you. So 
build on that, um, I'm curious, could you talk to how you were going to answer your questions? Like, we actually have a meal here. Oh, yeah. We were going to, well, go ahead. You, so, and tell me why you were going to do this, because I thought it was a great idea, but I also know <laughs> it would have gone <laughs> very messy. <laughs> okay. Can you just explain that? Maybe on the mic. All right, so I was actually going to use the wheel um, while answering questions, uh, while, like, because also I could show you guys how I would be doing stuff on the wheel. Like, if you had questions of, like, oh, like, the thinning thing that Max, that Max, Max asked, um, I could have shown you on the wheel how you can do that and, like, prevent that. Um, but I ended up not doing it, which is sad, but also I don't really want to make a mess on the floor. <laughs> Um, and yeah. I think sometimes there are things when you're working with your hands that speaking comes easier. Yeah. And that's what I think maybe you were talking about how you can listen to music and talk and build at the same time. It's almost like it's very close. Yeah. And I think you may have even felt more comfortable answering questions if you had the real time. A little bit distracted. <laughs> yeah, a little distracted, but that's maybe a good thing for you. Go ahead, Esther. Um, did you ever have experiences where you were stressed out before you were working with your pants in pottery and feel more relaxed or more regulated after because of your connection to the, the earth? Okay, uh, I would say I was never actually stressed going into the thing. The only thing I would be stressed about was waking up too late, but I <laughs> don't know. I don't think I'd be too... I would, don't think I was ever stressed going in, but I do think that it was much more relaxing because you are concentrated on one thing. And it's like your mind is only on that one thing instead of thinking about other stuff. And yeah, working with my hands does help me like concentrate on things. Like I'm always like, I don't know, like picking on my fingers and stuff. So it does help me like, I don't know, calm me down, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. because I feel like glazing is, I know I'm going to be getting mad at for saying this, but it's kind of stressful. I feel like I'm going to mess something up when I do the clay. Like I'm just like, oh, like maybe I shouldn't do that. But as soon as like you have enough freedom and like you practice enough, I feel like you would be able to like practice enough and like do your own thing, especially because Catherine knows so much. She, so she already knows like what she's going to do. But when I was first making this piece right here, I was scared that I was going to mess up the flowers or they were going to be too crowded or something, so I didn't add too much to it. Um, but to be honest, I feel like trimming and um, making the clay would be my favorite. Trimming is really satisfying, and you can kind of have like free reign on that as well. So, yeah. Uh, question for Um. I was wondering, um, I've heard pottery can be really frustrating, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if there were ever moments where you just got like really annoyed and maybe smashed your piece. Yeah, I have done that. So <laughs> actually quite a couple times. Um, so yeah, I was when I was first working like at home, I was using that wheel and part of the part of the piece was actually broken. It was held up with duct tape. And it was spraying up at me, like the water that was coming from the wheel was spraying up at me. And it wasn't exactly pleasant, so I got very mad and I got distracted, so I like messed up my piece. And the clay sometimes wasn't, uh, it was too dry or too wet, so it wasn't perfectly like going up. And usually when you got it perfectly done and then it just messes up a little bit, like what Max said, like got too thin and it ripped off, I have, yeah. I have smashed it a couple times. Um, also, when I like, it's good because clay is actually one of the things that you can reuse multiple, multiple times. Like, if you were to make a piece, if you were practicing, you'd be able to use that piece of clay so many times over again before it would actually not be useful anymore. Um, 
So yeah, that was part of the reason why I did smash them because I could just redo it again. because I always knew that I was quite an artistic person, but I never actually, I wouldn't say I talked to my clay as much as I probably wish I should have, but um, I feel like, I don't know, I knew I was an artistic person, I liked working with my hands, but I didn't know that I could actually create so much with actually doing stuff with my clay. I don't exactly know how to answer your question. No, that's fine. No, that does answer it. Okay. Second question. Um, when you were doing your research about the history, did any of it relate to why you might have been drawn to it at such a young age? Because you said, you know, your family had bits of art attached somehow. Did, did you find a connection there that kind of made sense to you as to why you might have picked to go with this specific point in that way? Actually, yeah. Um, not during the history, but as soon as he told me that, I thought of my dad when I was younger. So my dad, whenever I was younger, we would always be like, we traveled to Europe this one time. Um, and when I was at the beach, I would always be building sand castles and stuff. And this one time, we buried my sister in the sand <laughs> so that it looked like her ha head was like decapitated on the sand. And so that was probably something that I did think of. And also my dad used to draw a lot of cats when I was younger for me. They were like really good cats and I was always so impressed. So um, that's probably why I did some of the cats in my drawings. Um, and yeah, that's probably why. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Come on up, Amber. So my favorite one that I researched was um, the Egyptian finance. So can I pull it up or no? Uh, yes, I think oh, okay. so. So it is part of the first slides up here. And it was like one of the ones that I was so surprised by and I thought was very like, oh, missed it. Uh, this one right here is like one of the coolest ones that I saw. And I thought it would be really cool to create it. Because uh, there was a really cool story behind this piece as well. Can you show it? Oh, okay. So the story, so as you see, the mom is, uh, you can't really tell, but the mom is uh, with a kid, and the mom is a goddess. Her name's Isis. And she got pregnant with her son, Oris, and she tried to hide her pregnancy from her husband, which is pretty sneaky. And she, um, because the god of wisdom tried to tell her that her husband Seth would try and kill her child when it was born. So basically she tried to hide her pregnancy, but then she had the child and then Seth tried to kill her child later on. And, um, but she still survived because um, she had like this magical power over him or something. And I thought that that was really, really cool. And 
like making pottery now could have like that type of significance later. Um, so yeah, I thought that I could make something from Egyptian finance as well, because that would be really cool.
Test, test, test. Welcome to Masterworks. La di da di da.
go like this because with Ferris. Hello everyone and welcome back to Masterworks 2023. Uh, we have had the pleasure of learning from two students already. We're going on to our third. Thank you for joining us if you're on our YouTube channel, which we are live streaming. Uh, please ensure that all of your phones are on airplane mode so that we have no interruptions because we are so lucky that we get to learn from our 14 and 15 year old students who are the teachers for this entire week. Uh, Masterworks program is really the jewel of everything that they've learned how to do in their four years at Island Pacific School. They've researched and written a 20 to 40 page paper and this presentation is the best of that paper so that they can teach you the things that they've learned. So they are under the mentorship of members of our community which is a wonderful thing and really is a success of this program. So this was quite evident because we had our last presenter, Mrs. De Bucarena, learning from Catherine Epps, who is a master potter, and we have maybe created our own master potter in Miss Este Bucarena. So hands up for Mrs. De Bucarena. And so moving on to our next uh, topic, this is also a creator, and I would like to call up Mr. Matthias Thane to talk to us about electrifying a skateboard. When deciding my masterworks topic, I knew from the beginning that I was going to do something about electricity. The real struggle was what I was going to do with electricity and what it would do to me. <laughs> I've always had an interest in electronics and things I can drive around. Early on, my dad introduced me to remote controlled devices. It became our thing. We would spend hours flying RC planes at any flat open place. When my parents bought me a miniature ride on Jeep, I was hooked. Later, I made a step up by buying hoverboards and electric scooters, which saved up money from my grandparents that were unhappy with what I spent their money on. <laughs> In total, I wasted a lot of money on cheap garbage, and that's why I wanted to build something myself. The idea was that I would spend a quarter of the cost, and hopefully it would last a lot longer without breaking. At least that's what I thought. I chose to electrify a skateboard because I wanted to try something new, and my previous Masterworks ideas were a little far-fetched. Hello, my name is Matthias, and this is my Masterworks presentation. In our world today, it is more important than ever to do what we can to reduce the amount of damage we inflict on the environment. 
Electric alternatives may not be the solution, but they're a step in the right direction, especially when most of BC's electricity is from hydroelectric power. Most other cities' power comes from burning fossil fuels, but in British Columbia, we don't, making electric alternatives way better for the environment. The average gas engine wastes most of its energy, most of the energy found in gasoline. Imagine an explosion. What are the first three things you think of? Personally, I think of heat, light, and sound. But the fourth product of this explosion is the physical expansion and release of high pressure gases. This fourth and important product is what is powering your car. The leftover energy is not used in a combustion engine. And on top of that, there's 2,000 plus moving parts further reducing the efficiency of your vehicle. Electric alternatives are safe, quiet, and more powerful. So the question is, why don't we switch to all electric propulsion? Well, first off, it takes a lot longer to charge your battery than to fuel your car. And presently, most electric cars are more expensive. Although some electric cars are matching the price of other new cars, there aren't many options for an older, cheaper electric car that can hold up to the requirements of range and performance. So while electric cars are a good option, they're not for everyone yet. In recent years, we've made a lot of improvements in the electric car industry, and I anticipate much more in the near future. What is electricity? It's the flow of electrons in a circuit. Conductive materials like metal allow the flow of electrons, while simple, while Insulative materials like rubber do not. Current measured in amps is defined as the amount of electrons that flow through a certain point every measured amount of time. Voltage is the pressure or potential difference between electrons across a source or a load and is measured in volts. A source like a battery um, is what provides the flow of electrons. This is what gives the circuit power. Resistance measured in ohms is like a kink in a hose except you're draining electricity from that kink. The resistor is what converts electrical energy into usable energy. For example, a light bulb converts electrical energy into light. Electricity naturally wants to flow from one side of the battery to the other through the conductor. In a circuit, there is a source, which is where the power comes from, and there's a load, which is what drains the power. They're connected together by wires. You can have multiple batteries powering a circuit. These can be wired in two different ways. The first is having them in series. This means that you would connect the positive terminal of one battery to the negative terminal of the other battery, effectively merging them together. In this situation, the voltage combines and you get double the power. Secondly, in a parallel battery arrangement, you have batteries side by side working together, but not adding up their voltage. You can think of it as only one battery functioning at a time. The first battery gets used, and then the second battery. In this method, the voltage stays the same, but the battery will last twice as long. I did a project about homopolar motors in science class. This isn't the motor I used, but I thought it would be helpful to add. This motor was the first ever motor to be invented in 1821 by Michael Faraday. The homopolar motor, while very simple looking, is actually quite complex. It uses the Lorentz force principle, which essentially states that if the electric current is moving through the copper wire and the magnetic force inflicted by a magnet are at around a 90 degree angle to each other, then a magnetic force will be applied to the wire, pulling one side one way and one side the opposite way. In my opinion, the homopolar motor is a fun demo to do with your kids, but has no real world implications as it lacks any real torque and can't really power anything which is why the more modern electric motor is now used today in almost all utilities. In 1835, just 14 years later, two Dutchmen, Sabranda Stratine and Christopher Becker, invented the electric motor we now use today. The modern day electric motor doesn't use any special forces or rules other than the basic rules of electricity and magnetism. In an electric motor, there is an electromagnet, which is a magnet that is powered by an electric current. This electromagnet is made of copper wire. This copper wire is in the center of the motor and has two sides, one negatively charged and one positively charged. If you can see here. Um, one side of the copper wire is attracted to the magnet, so it spins the shaft to meet up with it. When the polarity of the wire is changed by flipping the positive and negative terminals of the electromagnet, 
essentially flipping the poles of the magnet, the copper wire is now repelled, and the other side of the wire is attracted. Repeat this, and you have rotation. This is what it looks like in a real motor. In the real world, electric motors are used in a number of things for a number of reasons, such as a more eco-friendly alternative to a standard combustion engine, as it doesn't release any emissions from the vehicle. Instead of using fossil fuels for its energy source, it uses batteries, which are charged by, electric, by electricity. Also, the electric motor is far more compact and does not heat up as much, so it's ideal for situations like a tiny fan inside your computer when you don't want to have fumes spewing out of it. In the world of cars and other personal vehicle applications, the electric motor doesn't require a gearbox and uses much less moving parts, further reducing friction. Electric motors can have more power than internal combustion engines, making them way more fun. A battery is quite simple in its basic components. A basic battery looks something like this. The battery stores its power in chemical energy. When the battery is charged, the electricity causes electrons to separate themselves into positive and negative groups. When the battery is connected in a circuit, the electrons pass through the wire and the load to the other end of the battery, mixing up the positive and negative electrons. The battery is now dead. In order to build an electric longboard, I needed to learn how to research and buy parts, build a board, and celebrate my success. So now that you know a bit about electricity and the basics, let's get into what I actually did. I researched electric hub motors, which are just motors embedded in the wheels on the skateboard, and I found that they're usually 150 watts and 26 to 36 volts max, and around $70 each. This means that they're relatively low powered. I would need two minimum, resulting in a 350 watt total power consumption, um, and the cost is around $150. Then I researched external drive motors, and these range from 100 to $150. They usually take around 1,000 watts to 2,500 watts, and around 40 to 60 volts. These are about $70 each, so total cost is around $140. I went with the external motors because they cost a similar amount of money, and they're more powerful than the hub motors. My dad bought a longboard for $89. <laughs> <laughs> I researched how I can mount the motors to the wheels, and I found that I could buy an electric skateboard motor mount that I could ta attach the motor to the trucks. These things. I also did some research on the electric motors and settled on a pair of 175 kilovolt, 4,000 watt motors. I found this mounting kit online that would provide me with all the parts I needed for the motor drive system. It was $140, and at the time that seemed like too much. So I bought all the parts separately. This turned out to make it more expensive. <laughs> this, is <a> common <laughs> this is a common theme in my project, by the way. <laughs> then I looked into the speed controller, which allows you to vary the speed of your board. I found an, a speed controller that was around $100 online. The only issue is with the cheaper ones, they wouldn't provide me with as much power. Later, I was looking into what I was going to do for the battery, and I figured that maybe I could use the battery out of my old electric hoverboard, but I soon found out that the battery is far too small and I wouldn't achieve both range and power. Then I thought, maybe I'll look into a battery from a wrecked electric vehicle, and I found one. It was a battery from a Segway that had crashed, but there was something wrong with the battery, but there was something wrong with the battery that had to be fixed. I ended up not using this battery because the seller took it off their page, and since I found nothing else, that could work, I started looking into building the battery myself, and I watched a few videos on the subject. I realized that the wheels on my longboard would not work for the gears and drive system, so I knew that I would have to replace them. Then I started to think about how cool it would be to have a board that could go off-road. I found a kit online for off-road wheels that have the gears and belts together with them. Here's a diagram for what goes on the board. So these are the motors, and that's the belt and the wheels. And then I didn't do a flexible battery, but there would be a battery, and then it, the speed controller goes around here. I bought the motors previously mentioned, and I, and I also bought all the parts I needed to build, um, to build my own battery. My battery has arrived, but it was late, so I went to bed. The next day, I glued the packs, <laughs> the next day I glued the packs together. 
um, and I plan to wire these packs in parallel packs of four, and then wire up all those packs in series. That way I get a 12S 4P battery pack. After I glued the packs together, I spot welded the connections to make up the 12 packs. I went to Rona and got some fibers tape that looked strong so that my battery would be protected. Then I started on the worst part of my masterworks, which is making these painful battery connections. The, the way that the electricity flows is it'll go in this wire, then across through the battery, and then jump with the connection, and then through that battery, jump with the connection, and so on until you get to here. Um, I kind of incorrectly wired the battery by accident, so the black wire is positive, and the red wire is negative. That caused many issues later, but <laughs> um, yeah. Then my motors arrive. What the? Oh, wait. Oh, man, I skipped some things. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so here's the battery management system. There's 12 wires, but it's really complicated, so I'll keep it brief. Basically, you have to put the wires on different parts of the pack, and it's just what charges the board. Uh, wait a minute. No. Okay, wait, sorry. This is me soldering. Um. So, I have this connection. Oops, I have one. Anyway. So then I did that, and you put flux on it, and then I'm adding solder to it, and now I'm soldering it on. Um, then my them, they're huge. <laughs> I got these wheeled called clouds, cloud wheels, and they have a foam core that provides with a lot of shock absorption, so they're perfect for a smooth ride. With them also came what I needed to build the drive system. I ordered the rest of my parts, and my motor mount came. My dad and I had a lot of problems getting everything to fit. The motors couldn't fit with the holes already drilled, so we had to make new ones. Something was always rubbing and grinding, and the motors were too big, so we had to put them in a weird configuration. Like, you know. Um, so at this point, everything was almost done, and all I had to do was mount everything to the bottom of the, of bottom of the board and program the speed controller. One week before the Masterworks presentation, as I was programming it, my speed controller burst into flames like a NASA rocket. I'm not kidding, the resemblance was uncanny. <laughs> All hope was lost, as you can see with this totally real photo of it burning. <laughs> I started to think of last minute options. It needed to be something that was already in Vancouver. And after trying many stores, I found a store specifically for electric skateboards that had what I need. So I bought the replacement and got to work soldering it up. I had one last near death experience and it was finished. Okay. So this is, this is me riding it to school. Okay. okay. Photo of me on it. Okay. This pro <laughs> project has taken a lot of time and work. I made it seem simple and straightforward, but in reality, there was a problem at every point. Pretty much everything that I bought required some sort of modification to work with the rest of the board. The battery connections really just took a lot of time, but it was more the little things, like when we would spend an hour trying to solder a connection only for it to break the next day. I think that with the help of, without the help of my dad, sorry, I think that with the help of my dad, I was not only able to complete it in time, but I was also able to keep my sanity. <laughs> but when I finally finished the project, I was so glad to not have to solder any other wires ever again. And now, <laughs> and now the grand unveiling.
where the battery is. That's the speed controller, and then obviously the motors. So I don't know if anyone can see this, so I'm going to hold it up. You guys have to realize how heavy this thing is. <laughs> my dad for his creative ideas and so solution making. Thank you to my mom for fronting the cost of the whole project. <laughs> and thank you to my aunt for helping me present and edit this project. Additionally, thank you to Pam and Jen for being the best advisor as I, advisors I could have had. I couldn't have done it without your help. Also, thanks to Damien from Bowen eBikes and that guy at the skateboard shop. Big help. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I forgot to I forgot to touch it. I forgot to touch the statue, but I guess maybe it's it's phony because I still presented without it. Um pretty cool. When I went to the shop and the guy said that, that it took him like four tries to build a battery and my battery functions so I don't know I guess I'm just <laughs> amazing but <laughs> also to the people that did not think that I would finish which is like everyone here um, <laughs> in your face. <laughs> and make something that would last. Um, and you talked a lot about the cost of everything. Matthias, come over here. Sorry, there is yeah. distracting. Talk a lot about the cost of everything. Did you do an analysis? What would it cost to buy an electric skateboard from that shop you finally found in North Bend compared to what it would cost you, or what it did cost you to make your own? Um, well, it really depends. Like, there's a lot of different levels, I guess. But I would say for, for a board of the level that I've made it, I mean, minus all the like, oh, it might fall apart, but, you know, minus all that, like, it, with, with everything it can do, it would probably be like $3,000, you know, if you were to buy one. 
And do you know how much you spent in the end? Did you figure out um, plus or minus? Yeah, for yeah, years? I have it. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Seven hundred fifty dollars divided by two times four divided by eight times yeah. four times two. And I, that is the correct number. Um, would you sell this board? Um, I mean, I don't think anyone would buy it, but <laughs> someone's I mean, like. I, I'm being serious. Now that you know how to do this, is it worth your work to actually make these and sell them? How about would oh, you make more money selling pretzels? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> the pretzels. The selling. amount of time. Um, um, yeah, I think I think that generally I think it's probably. I've put in more time than it's worth, but yeah, I, I maybe, probably not this one. I mean, the, those leather mud mud flaps are pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, at one point you did tell us you were going to get it done in about half an hour to put everything together, and um, I that was that was like if it well that wasn't the whole project, but from the point I was, I think it's technically possible. It's just you know when things when you almost die, it tends to slow the production down. Well, I've been, I was very impressed with your learning process. You're a true designer, because to go through all the pitfalls and all the thinking and creativity that you had to have to put that together, and your understanding of electricity, um, I was really super impressed. So thank you. Of differentials. Yeah, so the. I know what you mean yeah. by that, but I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> so each motor is spinning individually, correct? There, yeah, well, it's just a slight problem. I'm not sure why, but it doesn't really affect it. Because, like, yeah, as you were saying, I can show one of them spins up slow before the other. Is there a motor for each wheel? Yeah. Okay, well now it's working. It, it's really weird. But yeah, it just makes it so that it does burnouts when I'm not on it, which is honestly a plus, so. Is that because one, one starts before the other? Is yeah, so it, it has a slight turn, which causes it to spin. So many times. <laughs> um, when I was wiring it up the last time, the new ESC, um, well, like I said, because the wires are swapped on the motor, there was the, the well, so we en anyway, we were wiring positive to negative, negative to positive. It was a fair mistake, but Anyway, it kind of did this big plasma arc in my face, and it was pretty scary. <laughs> so, yeah. Hello. say I would probably have bought in better motor mounts that don't cause so many issues because it's definitely a pain even just to keep them up like I don't know they, they grind the belt like grinds with it and then these come off sometimes I don't know this whole motor mount system is kind of a pain but I would change that like maybe buy something and my second question have you hit anyone with it yet? <laughs> yes 
I've caused Olivia to have ankle damage, but that was actually her fault. She had the remote. So. And your aunt. All right. Wait, what happened? Oh, right, yeah. No, I hit her ankle, but yeah. Drove into your aunt. No serious damage. I think you can just ask for your seat. Oh, I'm just going to ask you. Yeah. Oh, All right, Mr. Payne, that was an amazing presentation. My question to you is, uh, what was your favorite part of, like, building it? Um... Favorite part? Standing on it and riding it. Yeah, riding it. I mean, that's not in the building, though. Oh... Uh, the mud flaps were pretty fun. <laughs> I guess, I guess uh, the battery was sort of fun to do, but in like a exhilarating, like I might die kind of way. But yeah, not, not much. Okay, we have a question from your grandpa, and he's an electrician, so watch out. I think it's going to be a good one. I'm not an electrician. Okay. How, how, how do you, how do you uh, break that thing? How, how do you stop it? Um, the motors have regenerative braking, which yeah, slows you down. Yeah, it works well. So they just, the motors break for me. Like, what, what do you do? Reverse the current? Um, no, well, it's just you push forward to go forward, and then you brake to brake. Oh, you, you, you take that. You're saying that you're breaking the, the electricity supply. Yeah, well, it's reversing the motor direction, I'm pretty so sure. So it must be reversing the motor direction. Also, in other yeah. words, it goes backwards. Yeah. The well, they, goes they, I guess it slows it, yeah. And, and how, how effective is that? Quite. I can stop pretty aggressively. You can. Well, actually, one of my belts is slipping, which makes me not stop aggressively, so that's kind of worrying, but it's okay. <laughs> when the belts aren't slipping, then, yeah, I can stop, like, can like throw you off the board, stop, which has happened. Uh, Mr. Saruk, come on up. It's just the great nines. That was a fantastic presentation, Mr. Payne. Um, you talked about really wanting to work with electricity. Is there anything else that you would like to put a motor on in the future, or something like that? Um, I like the idea of electric surfing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be cool. Okay, next question from Lee. Latex. Yes. Um, amazing pre presentation, Mr. Fang. Um, was there ever a point in your in your project where you just want to like smash your thing pieces? <laughs> Many times, mostly <laughs> with the soldering, because we had some failures because. Um, originally I had the wires so big and my supply of wires was like from a very bad, I mean Rona has horrible wires, <laughs> just really bad. So they were a pain to solder and yeah, a couple times where I just kind of was like, father take it, do it, and you're <laughs> like, you know, exchange out, swap us, because it's painful. A couple times where we had to, I think, it was a very effective way of doing it where like, you know, we, I mean, he was a big help in us. brakes are just with the motors. The motors slow it down. So I guess they, honestly, I'm not really sure how it works, to be honest with you. But yeah, just the motors, they, I guess they try to spin backwards or something like that. Like the, it reverses the direction of the motors to, and I guess I think it applies current to like slow them down. And it also charges the battery when I brake, which is pretty good. Mr. Bing, excellent presentation. Um, there's a lot of components 
in your product. And I'm wondering, was that the process of figuring out what you needed to make this product and what you learned about sourcing and testing those um, elements? Um, I guess I learned that not everything is compatible. Actually, nothing is compatible. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think that it was, I learned a lot about um, being specific with what I find, because some of my parts were very um, eclectic, which did not really work for the project. Yeah, well, I, I guess I just, well, I, I, there was a part, it was a wheel I was going to get, and it had the same, there's a, a gear that slots into the wheel, and it had a part for the gear to slide in, but I realized that it actually wasn't meant for electric skateboards, even though it looked like it, so I had to look in and figure out that it actually wasn't at all the same system. So I have a question about that. Um, it, you said a couple of times you watched a video or you tell me that you found these parts. Is there a community of uh, electric skateboard builders out there that like to vlog and post videos? Yeah, there was definitely, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to build the battery without videos online. And yeah, there's definitely quite a lot of a following for electric skateboards. Although they're not, they're not super prominent in Vancouver. Maybe you but could uh, become a, a YouTube sensation and <laughs> teach people how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> That's a sure um, Yes, I have, I have two questions. One, one is my question, and one is from your uncle. And I was out of the room because there's no Wi-Fi mm -hmm. or cell service in here, so I might, it might have already been answered. So I'll just ask the two questions again. So the first one is from your uncle who has watched this in Munich live, so that's kind of cool. Um, so he wanted to find out um, whether this would inspire a follow-up project and building something else and what might that be. Did you already answer that? Or? Not really. Not really? So what might that be? Uh, I mean, I have one. I, I, I have interest in electric scooters because I have one, but it kind of broke. It's also not the best, like one. So my my dad was thinking of trying to make that work again. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess I mean it so wasn't. Surfboard. Yeah, I did say surfboard, <laughs> but it's a little less. I, the budget on that is a lot higher. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and even than this. The second question, or my question, is. Um, I think we talked about this earlier when we were building the battery pack, and I said, Is it, doesn't that generate a lot of heat? Mm. And did you not have to find a way to cool that battery pack? Um, and I see that it's enclosed in this Dremel plastic kit, so I'm just wondering how it keeps cool, or does it need to be kept cool? It's really a question on sustainability, I guess. Like the battery, the cooler it is, the longer it lasts. But I haven't really put in much to cool it. And you um, also haven't probably used it that much, right? Yeah, I haven't. But I, I've, the motors get fairly hot, but I think that's normal. Um, the ESC does get a little hot, but I have that kind of, well, I mean, it's, it's sort of cool, I guess. I mean, there's, there's air brush, brushing over it. <laughs> Although the battery's actually kind of sunken into the box, so I guess there's no real cooling at all. Yeah. But it should be fine. I don't think it heats up that much. Okay. Here's your question. Uh, are you going to do this question? I do, but I thought No, you can go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thane, that was a fascinating presentation. And what I was just really impressed with was not only your uh, technical skill that you developed to put this thing together, which to me looks like a terrifying contraption, 
That's for sure. But also the, the knowledge that you have demonstrated here about electricity, and you mentioned talking about electrifying our transportation grid. I've heard on the radio that's supposed to, our plan as a nation is to try and do that as quickly as possible and get there in 10 years or something. My question to you is, as you do this, do you think that's a good idea? It seems very complex and difficult. Is, in your opinion, do you think electric transportation is the answer? Or are there pitfalls that we are ignoring? Well, I mean, there's definitely, it's definitely not a perfect system. I mean, obviously, the, it could be really the biggest problem is just with the source of energy, I would say. How do you mean? Like the battery or whatever is powering it. It's definitely a hard topic to get over, just the fact that if you have something that's electric, you're not going to be able to just go as far and you're not going to be able to um, rely on it as much. Right. And there's not as much options for like, oh, I'm out of electricity, let me just zap a full tank, you know? You can't really... Um, yeah. Yeah, well, it's great. It's phenomenal. And I mean, there is... Some people say, you know, electric cars are bad for the environment because the lithium they have to mine up is... Um, a pretty rare source, and I don't think it's, I think the mining of it is like bad for the environment, but I mean, to be honest, at this point, we kind of have to pick our battles, I guess, and you know, the, obviously depleting planetary resources is not the best, but if it's, you know, that or polluting the environment further, it's, you know, what's going to kill us first, really? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Excellent presentation and excellent um, skateboard, you know, in my space. Um, <laughs> oh, what problems did you anticipate and did any of them come true? Problems? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I didn't anticipate much problems, to be honest. <laughs> but I guess I was worried about building the battery because there is definitely a lot of danger there. With you know, high voltage. I think it's something like ridiculous, like 200, 300 amps or something. It's ridiculous. I don't know. It was pretty high, but, and the voltage is also pretty high. So, I mean, it's, I pro it's probably couldn't kill me, but it would be pretty bad. So I guess I anticipated that something might go wrong in the battery, but nothing did. So. Yeah. I just have one simple question. You mentioned that your battery pack is being housed in a Dremel toolbox. My question to you is, where do you plan on storing your Dremels? <laughs> this is also a Dremel box. They're both Dremel boxes. As a result, we've got Dremel bits all over the house. <laughs> But I'm not sure. I might be able to. No, no, don't. Oh, don't. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sealed. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's, it, I mean, you can't really see much. Just it's like a white pack. This is the I guess soldering, reluctantly. It's not my favorite, but that could help me, I guess. And um, I guess problem solving is a big part, because you know, there were so many different issues that we had to overcome, especially with the belts, but also with the batteries. You know, the configuration and when I wired things wrong. <laughs> Or any future contraptions that you make or 
I mean, I already was, but I think now I can successfully do it. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Great job. Uh, do you have a model? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
chapel and school there would be perfect, and it's got a clean yeah. room. Yeah. And then after this, we have lunch at 1 o'clock. We're back in here for full scores, masterworks, on the ethical and conscientious eating. So, you've been a great audience, lots of awesome questions. Thank you for that. And Matthias, with your helmet on, we would love to see you. Okay. <laughs> I love that.